Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of Prehistory in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons and our channel members from our sister channel over at History in the Dark. You are the reason why this content remains irritating. I am very irritating. I'm sorry. I'm trying my best. And today, we are going to discuss the Irritator, which is a dinosaur. They actually named a dinosaur Irritator. Why would they do that? Let's find out. This is the story of the Irritator. The Irritator is a genus of Spinosaurid dinosaur that only contains a single species, Irritator challengeri. They lived in the early Cretaceous period in what is now Brazil, about 113 to 110 million years ago. Looking at the whole skeleton, you can see why it's a Spinosaurid. Minus the sail, it looks like a Spinosaurus. However, the Irritator were much, much smaller. They're actually one of the smallest Spinosaurids out there, dwarfed by pretty much every other one, including Baryonyx and Suchomimus. They would have had a length of about 7.5 meters or 25 feet, and weighed about one ton. So, as you can tell, when I say that they were smaller than other Spinosaurids, I mean that's true, but they were still big enough to eat, like, us. So, you know, just so we're clear on that. And like other Spinosaurids, they were predators and likely semi-aquatic. Their long alligator-like snouts would have been best for hunting large fish. The fish-eating, or piscivorous behavior, is supported in Spinosaurids by looking at their teeth, which don't actually have serrated edges, making them suitable for grabbing and holding on to prey, like a struggling fish. Teeth in other theropods seem much better for tearing or cutting. The Irritator would have likely spent most of its time either in the water or near the water hunting fish. If it could get a hold of land-based prey, it would have done that too. And it's one of those dinosaurs that doesn't get brought up very often, but you know, I'm just ignoring the obvious question on everybody's mind right now. Why in the blue heck did they name it Irritator? Well, the genus name does come from the word irritation, reflecting the feelings of paleontologists as they worked on the skull of the holotype specimen. Why? Well, the irritating part of the situation had nothing to do with the animal itself. It had to do with what the paleontologists had to go through to get an accurate reconstruction of this blasted thing. See, the original holotype for this creature was excavated from a chalk concretion that contained the rear part of a large skull with lower jaws near the town of Santana do Quiriri in northeastern Brazil. That fossil was not acquired by scientists initially. It was acquired by fossil dealers. The seedy underworld of fossil dealing has a lot of unscrupulous characters that do a lot of questionable things with the fossils. Paleontologists hate this fact of life because, well, they want the fossils for research purposes to expand human knowledge. But where there's profit to be made, there's always going to be a black market, whether it's banned or not. In this case, the dealers did wind up selling it to Rupert Wilde, who worked for the State Museum of Natural History in Stuttgart, Germany. When he first received the skull, he actually thought it belonged to a giant basal pterosaur, since the region where the fossil was discovered is actually known for having a lot of pterosaur fossils. German and British pterosaur experts were contacted to study it, and a paper describing it as a pterosaur had already been submitted for publication when the authors, German paleontologist Eberhard Frey and British paleontologist David Martill, were actually steered away from that idea by peer reviewers of the report, who began to suggest the fossil actually belonged to a theropod, based off of closer examination. See, the skull had been flattened sideways, and was partially crushed. That isn't unusual for fossil finds. They've been in the ground for millions of years, and the ground shifts. It's almost expected that there's going to be some level of damage to a fossil when it's found in the modern day. Additionally, by the time they got a hold of it, only the right side was well-preserved. The left was actually damaged quite badly during collection, not while it was in the ground, because the people that took it out of the ground weren't professional paleontologists. They were just looking to make some money and didn't know how to handle the fossils properly. 
Some of the skull's hindmost upper surface had actually eroded, and the lower jaw lacked its front end. Those issues were credited as a side effect of being stuck in the ground for that long, and some other cracks were due to being part of a septarian concretion. But the tip of the upper jaw was also missing, and there were no signs of erosion in that case, leading them to believe that it had actually been broken off during or after the fossil's collection. There was also corrosion on certain bones, indicating that acid preparation had been attempted and done badly. A vertical fracture was actually present in the middle of the skull, and that had apparently been sealed with car body filler. Yes, really. And likely in the hopes of making it look more complete and therefore more valuable, the traders had severely obscured the skull beneath plaster, making it look a lot better than it was. Rupert Wilde was not aware of any of these modifications when he purchased the fossil, and it was only really noticed when it was sent to the United Kingdom to be run through a CT scanner. That scan showed the sellers had actually tried to reconstruct the skull by grafting parts of the maxilla, which is the main upper jawbone, onto the front of the rostrum, the snout. They did this badly, and it actually wound up with the snout much longer than it should have been. When the homicide was officially described in February of 1996, in a paper that credited David M. Martill, Arthur R. I. Cruikshank, Eberhard Fry, Philip G. Small, and Maria Clark, they wrote that the reason they called it Irritator is because of the irritation they personally felt when they discovered that the snout had been artificially elongated. The process of preparing the fossil was much, much longer as a result of all this straight-up damage, frankly. It was a painstaking process to get the holotype back into what could be called its original form, at least as close as they could possibly get, and they were annoyed, as they had a right to be. Because the fossil collectors, who paleontologists already don't really care for, had made their jobs ten times harder. So, yeah, thanks for that, guys. And to make matters worse, we still don't know exactly where this fossil was even taken from, so paleontologists have no way of looking further at the site themselves to see if there's any more remains of these creatures. They managed to gather a lot more data since then, and the holotype, now that it's actually fixed, has provided plenty of insight, but we could always use more. And yet, we still don't quite know. The Irritator's legacy is kind of a case example of the issue of fossil trading. Inviting people to buy and sell fossils might sound like a fun thing to do, and sure enough, I get it, I'd like to own a fossil one day. But the problem with that is, not only are you robbing the scientific community of further data on these prehistoric creatures, but you, and I, probably don't know exactly how best to handle a fossil as we are not trained to do so. And many of these collectors have no idea what they're holding, or how best to handle and preserve it for study. And in this case, they used various tools that are not at all recommended, that wound up making the job for actual scientists that much more difficult. So I guess what I'm saying here is this. If you yourself wind up finding a fossil, please tell an actual paleontologist that you have done so. Notify the nearest natural history museum. Because just by touching it yourself, you may cause damage to it, and cause the whole of humanity to lose knowledge that's been preserved for millions of years. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.